Our text for today is taken from the book of Isaiah, the 55th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The first thing that we've got to talk about is this word right from the beginning that we might just kind of skip over. And in the Hebrew language, there's several words that say, Listen, <laughs> don't skip over this or pay attention because the things that I'm going to say to you could easily be misunderstood. And all of that fits with what this text is teaching us. It would be very easy for someone today to read these first few verses of the text and think of communism. That's not at all what this text is about. Not encouraging it. Are there times in the Bible where the people are communal, sharing all things? Yes. And a lot of charity, the church has supported a lot of charities through the ages, haven't they? It was churches that started hospitals. It was churches that ran schools for much of our history. You know, if you think about the public school system that we have today, we're talking 70 years out of all of history. This is not a political topic by any stretch of the imagination. He's using the words for food and drink to talk about something so much greater than food and drink. And it's hard not to make a comparison to what we will be eating and drinking in our service later on. Spiritual food. And he clearly says that. What's he really getting at? Well, we see that in verse 3. Incline your ear and come to me. It's not just about the food, but what's underneath the food. What is he really getting at? And so what do we see here? That he's wanting us to have a healthy diet, a healthy spiritual diet diet. We see that in the, the incredible words of God, how he uses other things to picture things, teaches a heavenly story with an, uh, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, as Jesus spoke to us in parables. Come by, eat without money. Almost sounds like a contradiction if you think about it. But come and eat. It's like a church potluck that we have here. Well, I didn't bring anything. Well, just come and eat anyway. I'm sure there's going to be enough. And so what is he really saying? Come by and eat. Come and be filled with the spiritual food. You don't have to pay for it. 
It's free. And it's all dependent upon God as you continue to read the verses. Because he's the one paying for it. The son of God who came to offer his life, he paid the bill. And what's more interesting is that the heavenly food, the healthy food, is the heavenly food. The good stuff. I know that for years people have talk, been talking about living more healthy. It's almost embarrassing when those videos from the 80s come on and you see the people doing the jazzercise exercises and your kids look at you and look, you didn't live through that, did you? Really? I'm like, yeah, I remember that sadly. I still remember when Leno would come on and have himself, his face put on those guys dancing as a joke. What is he saying here? Let the, eat the food that is healthy. Let your soul delight itself in abundance because my word is full of everything that you need to sustain yourself. There's an opposite side to that though. Why do you spend your money on food that isn't good for you? How many times have we gone into a store and the kids go into the candy aisle and <laughs> there were a number, not just the kids. <laughs> um, it was interesting to see what my kids took to school with them yesterday. Someone we know sent the boys each a five pound tub of Twizzlers. Tolly had a huge, couple of huge sacks of Skittles that people gave her. I don't know who made out more. What is God talking about when he says, don't spend your money on things that are not food? He's talking about false religions and false idols. And if you didn't pick it up, it comes with a cost, doesn't it? Why do you spend your money on things that are not food? And there's two costs, really, when you think about it. Those things cost because they disrupt our relationship with God. And they hurt us. We're not in a healthy relationship with him. We're not being fed by him if we're looking to other sources for our ideas. And there are often earthly consequences for the sins that we do. Whether it's in our relationships, in our own bodies, because of certain sins that we might commit, And it's hard for me not to think of the past and to go, you know, what did they do with their, when they were sacrificing to idols? They would even throw their babies into the fire as a sacrifice to the false gods. And what haven't we advanced past in our world today? It's still big in the news, isn't it? You see, this isn't about food. Incline your ear to me. And we need to be reminded that faith comes by hearing the message. It does not come from within. It comes from outside. That's why I hope you still pray when you sit down to eat and ask God's blessing on the food that it would strengthen your bodies and be to our good. 
Not only does faith come by hearing the message, but the message is heard through the word of the Lord. They're connected. Then Isaiah does something interesting that some people would misunderstand. Isaiah points back to David. And we have the phrase in our text, the sure mercies of David. Well, what kind of part of speech is of David? Is it an objective or a subjective genitive? And you might be thinking, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, was David the one showing mercy? Or was David the one being shown mercy? And Isaiah does something that David himself does in the Psalms. Even though he's mentioning David, he's not really meaning David. He's meaning the one that would come from David's line. Like if you read Psalm 22, they've cast locks for my clothing. I can count all my bones. They've pierced my side, my hands, and my feet. Okay, well, who is David talking about there? He wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about Christ, the one to come. In Matthew's sermon on Pentecost, he does the same thing. It was David talking about himself when he wrote these words, that the body will not see corruption. Well, we have David's body here buried in our country. It's corrupted. Who was David really talking about? The one who would not stay in his grave. Many times in the Psalms, it's not David that he's talking about. Even he's writing it himself. He sees what his savior, what his descendant would do. And so that's what Isaiah is talking about. Because who's, who's he talking about? Because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Who's doing the work? It's the Lord. The son who would come and pay the bill. And so Isaiah is not talking about what David did, but the prophecy that would be yet to come. And what was the prophecy? I have given him as a witness to the people. What? Greater words could we think about when we think about Christ and his ministry than that. I have come so that you might have life. I have come from the Father and I go back to the Father. But that you should know the Father, look at me. David didn't have the mercies of his own. He was shown mercy. <clears throat> and again, it ends with, because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel. Who is that Holy One of Israel? That was Jesus. We have a reminder of that in our gospel text, right? There is no one good except God. Why do you call me good? Well, what was the man testifying to? Then there's also further prophecy in the text. The nation, nations will come. <clears throat> this isn't an empire that David had. This is far stretching, much greater than David's kingdom. Not just one kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, but the kingdom of God. filled with many nations, others that would come and learn to follow Christ, to follow the eyewitness accounts of his disciples written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is not a human utopia by any stretch of the imagination, is it? 
where, oh yeah, everything's free, come and eat, do whatever you want. This is the kingdom that God has established. As we talked about in the sermon last week, the kingdom of grace to which we are invited here on earth. When we pray thy kingdom come, we're praying that God's kingdom come on us here. That we follow the witness that was given to the people, the Holy One of Israel. We hear his word. We recognize him as our shepherd, our leader, the one who would take us to his kingdom. That's the other, thy kingdom come, isn't it? What precious words. And it's not something that is just a free meal. Come watch this five-hour presentation. You can have a free vacation on us. And you know what kind of pressure you're going to be put upon for that free vacation. This is the invitation of God. Pure and unadulterated something much greater than just a free meal. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, let that peace be with our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.